realize in America, one in 10 people are on antidepressants. Over 60 million sleeping prescriptions for sleeping aids are prescribed. We are in the greatest, and it is, it's, it's a crossover from an epidemic to pandemically, um, a nation that has become so dependent on its legalized drug pushers. And I don't want anybody here thinking I'm against conventional medicine. I'm not. I believe those great words spoken by my late husband, trust in God, but keep your powder dry, as Cromwell so aptly put it. So you're not going to hear an argument against or for simply everything in moderation. If we need a little assistance sometimes, even that too should be considered with prayer, that maybe the things that we think are so wrong with us are not necessarily, and there are, by the way, there are real diseases uh, when people speak about depression. There are actually real cases where people actually don't, don't tell someone who says they're depressed that it's just their imagination. Anyone ever told you you're just imagining how you're feeling? Well, then you must have a very dark imagination. It's very real. There are biological reasons. There's plenty of people in the Bible, by the way, who suffered depression. I know that's such a foreign idea that we should actually search the scriptures to find people we may identify with, that we may understand what the causes and cures for these type of spiritual ills. Now listen, this is not a, a, a prescription for your mental health today. One size fits all. You'll hear me and you'll all walk out of here on cloud nine. It's all fixed because Pastor Scott said it's all good. Well, at least this is what I love about my calling and about this church. At least I'm not worried to come and tell you the way it is. I'm not ashamed to tell you that any individual in the pulpit, I'm not even speaking about you in the pews, in the pulpit, any individual who says they don't go through those ebbs and flows, those spiritual highs and spiritual lows, the liar. And the reason is very simple. Because if the person in the pulpit really cares about the people sitting in front of them, there's bound to be this absolute desire to want the very best for you, for your hearts and your minds to be open, to grow, to become all that God intended you to be. There's the spiritual attack from the enemy who doesn't want you to prosper and grow spiritually and doesn't want the person standing in the pulpit to prosper and be able to help you along. When I speak of prosperity, I don't speak of the tangible, but I speak of the spiritual. So. I determined that I would at least point a few things out in Scripture because I know within this congregation, you who are listening who I can't see on the Internet or on radio, I can't see you. But the faces that are in this sanctuary, I know most of your faces. Oh, I know most of your faces. Yes, I do. <laughs> Sometimes a very jovial smile, and other times it's just silent glances that that's all that needs to be said. Now, listen, there are many causes for the saints to be down. And again, you know, let me just indulge me for just a minute because I have to have my weekly catharsis of stuff that I just can't stand, and I share it with you, and then we get on. But <laughs> see, this is, this is, this is why I love you so much, because you let me do this. This is like part of coming to church. You let me pour it out there. But I, you know, the, the current buzzwords this week, I heard two very prominent evangelists saying, legacy and destiny. And I thought, oh, crikey. <laughs> do you really need some soft, toned person to tell you that you are a person of destiny. If you belong to the Lord, you know you have a greater purpose in life. 
You know that there's some, God has destined you for something. Do you need the gibberish of somebody? People of destiny. And we have a destiny conference, and we have destiny movements, and <laughs> Lord only knows what other things develop in your destiny. And the other one is legacy, which I'm sorry to say, but it was a, it was a Protestant minister you, tossing around that term, and I just, you know me, I'm curious. I had to look up the etymological root and use of that word, because it really bothered me that he tossed it around that much, and that comes out of the Catholic Church legate. So I thought, oh, that's appropriate. <laughs> Nothing like a good Protestant tossing around some good Catholic doctrine. <laughs> yeah, all right. That's why, that's why I protest, <laughs> very much so. Now, most of you know, and I'm sure if you don't, especially for the newer ones listening today, the Christian faith begins with a miracle, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If your starting point in Christianity, if someone can adequately point the starting point for you, and you spend the time to investigate concepts that we here in this ministry take for granted, perhaps, but take the time to investigate. The stone wasn't rolled away to let Jesus out. It was rolled away so that those on the outside could come in and the declaration could be made, He is risen, He is risen indeed. Christianity begins there. If you can cross that miracle point, which is probably the greatest, and I, I, th I think it's the greatest miracle and the toughest thing to wrap your mind around, that God said he would accomplish a thing, that he brought it to pass, that it did happen indeed. If you can investigate, search the proofs, if that is your starting point, the rest of your journey will be filling in those gray areas that are the remainder of Scripture and the remainder of your life, of your Christian life, filling in the blanks of what previously were consumed with other things, not relevant, not necessary. Now, if that's the basis of our faith and we start there, then everything else that I say can be built upon that and we can always reach back to that point. And the reason why I, I make this comment in passing about the resurrection is because they, there will be people today listening to me deliver this message and then when I'm done giving you all the information, they'll, they'll come back to, yeah, but I'm still over here. No, no, I want to tell you first of all about the power of the resurrection. If Jesus Christ did indeed raise up from the dead as he said he would on the third day as he said he would, and if we take the time to investigate how the people around him were so radically changed, then it means for you too a radical change. And I don't believe in a one-time event. I believe in the course of your Christian life there will be radical changes. Some of them will be so radical that people you don't see for years will, they'll encounter you and say, gee, what's up with you? you? You seem different, but nothing's changed except what's on the inside now flowing out of you is that which God gave to you, God flowing through you. So I want to make full circle. I'm starting by making this point, but now let me trickle down into the reality, contrary to the popular evangelists and speakers of the day who tell you, you just got to let it go. Just let it go, and it'll go away. You ever tried letting it go? <laughs> Did it go away? That's why I say, it's, if it's not profitable for you, where you can't grab hold and make it something you can latch on to, don't bother with it. It's not profitable. Now, many people in the Bible, God's people, suffered extreme highs and lows. The one that comes to my mind immediately, don't turn to any of these passages. I just want to reference them. The one that comes to my mind immediately, you can't help it, is Elijah. He's the first one. If you ever get down, I'm talking about really, really get down. Please go to those chapters that speak of his great victory on Mount Carmel, who, you know, what bravery to defeat those heathen Baal worshipers. What victory 
and then to be scared and go run off somewhere under a juniper tree and ask God to kill him. He just wanted to die. Now, I don't listen, I don't want to see hands. If you identify with any of these people and they're real to you, they're not just good Bible stories, you'll find yourself at some point in the Elijah mode where you've, you've had a great victory and maybe the cause of you wanting to lay down under your juniper tree and talk to God that way is because you expect your whole life to be the victory, mountaintop experience, conquering the enemies and being victorious. You know, it's, it is so misleading what happens today in today's Christianity. We're told by these popular speakers that you can live on the mountaintop every day is the mountaintop experience. What about half the people in the Old Testament? Tell me they spent all of their time on the mountaintops. Because my Bible tells me there's way more valleys, way more under the tree experiences, and I'm not ashamed to declare those two. That's part of understanding why we go through what we go through. Elijah's won. Great victory. And then we expect every day to become a victory. And when it's not, all you do is you keep looking back at that moment when you were on the mountaintop. It's kind of like this church a little bit. Some of you have already come through it. Most of you have, thank God. But we had some of you that all you could do was look back to those battles back there and say, well, we were there. We were on the top fighting the battle, and all you did was look back and you quit marching forward. And at some point, the inertia, everything coming to a halt while you were busy looking back there, marching forward ceased. You stood still, and all you could think about were the glory days. Oh, those were the good old days. Now here it comes. It all settles in. There's no looking up anymore. It's all what was back there. So trust me, these are words for all of us to just take in. There are people like Jonah. When we think of Jonah the prophet, we don't think of depression. We think of a guy who had a calling on his life to go and preach to some people, and he didn't want to go, so he ran the other way. But if you read in the fourth chapter of his book, he was kind of... You know, God, just strike me out now. I just can't take this. After a great victory of going to preach to Nineveh and the people repented, I'm asking you, this is a rhetorical question. Why does everything have to always be that we have to keep looking for those mountaintop experiences? And if they don't come, we're just, either there's something wrong with me or there's something wrong with God. And I think there's something wrong with him because nothing wrong with me. <laughs> because I'm just the same old person I used to be. And he's awfully, he's not doing anything. You see what I'm saying, being satirical. There's Job. Bet you didn't know, I took the time to look up all the sad sack people in the Bible, <laughs> just to comfort you today. Don't talk to me about letting it go. Maybe I don't want to let it go today. Maybe I just like holding on to it. Here's Job. Has everything taken away from him? You know, I've preached on the opening chapters of that book and just kind of backed away a little bit because I realized as you go through the book progressively, he starts to get down there. He's, forget about the boils you thought were bad enough he couldn't get relief from. Then his friends, and finally he's in the dust. He's on the ground, and it just, is there anything more that could happen to me? And I have these people that have just completely destroyed my person before God, but I'm not ready to let it go, by the way. And all of these have dimensions of things. Sometimes when we speak about people being spiritually depressed, and hear me out, because you say, well, the terms are tossed around in the medical world, but what about in the spiritual realm? What about those people who seem to have everything at one point, and they lose it all? Now, another one that comes to my mind, I taught on this a few weeks ago on festival, is Naomi, out of the book of Ruth. You know, her name means pleasant. And as you know, her daughter and daughter-in-law are with her, or her, it's Ruth, and her sister, the husbands are dead. Naomi's husband is dead, so now there are no children. There is no possibility of having children. She tells the two daughters, go back. Ruth 
wants to stay with Naomi, and as they're coming back into town where they, they may have been known by the people in the town, they ask, is that Naomi? Her name means pleasant, by the way, or pleasantness. Is that Naomi? They couldn't recognize her because she was so filled with bitter, and she said, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Because I went out full, and the Lord brought me back empty. Your fault. <laughs> and that can begin the spiral downward, as we don't understand necessarily that God's plans for us. Jeremiah 29 says, God's plans, King James says thoughts, but God's plans for us are plans of shalom, of peace, not of evil, for your future good. It's always difficult for us to see that future good in the moment where things just look like they've fallen apart. I at least managed to tab some of the things in my Bible. I thought, I might turn to this, or I might turn to that, because I have a text I want to use but I'd like to set the stage for all this. I think about people like Nehemiah, who was sad. His countenance was sad in the presence of the king. In his case, he was sad and downcast because he knew that the city, Jerusalem, and its gates were in disrepair. So his whole behavior had to do with the things of God. Because the things of God were in disrepair, his spirit was down. So through the Bible, you can chronicle all these people, and you can get a sense that not everybody lives on the mountaintop. And even the most beloved psalms that we have preached here, you know, I think of one of the messages that Dr. Scott used to preach on a regular basis. In fact, one year, I think he preached on it three or four times with Psalm 84. And the lesson we all took from that is blessed men go through valleys of weeping. There are enough words in the Bible to tell me it's part of the trip. Sometimes being sad and being downcast is part of the trip. In Psalms 42 and Psalm 43, the side-by-side -side Psalms, the question is, why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? What is, it, what is it that has your nature so drawn down? The answer the psalmist gives, by the way, is in plain view. The light of his countenance, as, as I'm looking into that light right now, and almost being blinded, but as I'm looking into that light, it lights up my face. But the minute I aim my face towards myself and I start to back away, my face becomes dark. And the psalmist figured out that if he quit looking to himself and within himself and self-pitying, himself, but looking towards the light of his countenance, being God, his whole nature and demeanor would be brightened. Now, it doesn't just happen like that. Sometimes we have such deep sorrow grooved into our lives that moving on and looking upward is the most difficult thing we'll have to do. While everybody's concerned about things, what I, I said there, to me, completely irrelevant, I'm concerned about you, your spiritual health as a congregation. And to me, this message feeds at least the idea there's nothing wrong with you as an individual. Some of the things that you've gone through that have, where you felt, wow, I'm really at the bottom now. Part of your trip. I was reading in Psalm 23, and it dawned on me. I, this is like a, a spiritual slumgullion right now. I'm just throwing all this out at you. In Psalm 23, the psalmist David says, He leadeth me. You remember that song? He leadeth me. Isn't that what it says? He leadeth me. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness. He leads me. And then in the next verse it says, Yea, though I walk through the shadow of the valley of death, well, this is what I'm saying to you today. If he leads, and he leads in paths of righteousness, and he's also with you as you walk through those dark places, yet it's still required of you sometimes to walk through those dark places. God's not going to make the light shine perpetually on you so that you never have certain experiences that either will make you run towards him and cleave to his word more or run away and hide like Jonah. And if God wants you just like Jonah... God will keep after you and annoy you until, like Jonah, you say, okay, God, I surrender. 
but it really, it struck me. How deceptive would it be if I only came to you and said, it's sunny, it's always sunny. Welcome to the Scott Church, it's always sunny. <laughs> hmm, Stepford Wives, wasn't that something like that? I don't know. <laughs> And I, believe it or not, I, I think much of Christianity has succumbed to that. Now listen, we're told to let the joy of the Lord be our strength. But how on earth do you get to that place when you can't even get yourself up out, just, just to get up? Now, I'm not going to tell you all, oh, come on, you do it, be a stoic now, get on your feet. But I'm going to tell you rather what it says from God's Word. And when I read this, I said, you know, I'm going to deliver this message to you whether you like it or not because whether you like it or not and whether I like it or not in our human condition, we're all going to need these instructions. Hopefully it'll become to you like a Psalm 84, but you'll take these with the instruction meant to give you the courage to stand up once more. Open your Bibles to Isaiah 52. And while you're turning there, let me just say that I'm not really inclined to give you the historical background to the 52nd chapter. That is not my intent. We do enough history teaching out of Jeremiah and other books on festival. My intent today is to lift this off the pages. The only thing I will say to you as a backdrop to this 52nd chapter of Isaiah is the people of God abandoned worshiping him. They desired worshiping their idols. Maybe you were listening when I taught on festival out of Jeremiah, the type of idols that they went out, chopped down the tree and fashioned it with their hands and put gold and silver on it. Called it the melon, the, the scarecrow in the melon patch. Lifeless, must be picked up and moved around. Well, these people <clears throat> succumb to that. And I've tried to say for weeks, maybe months, I see the church today doing the same thing, making what they desire God to be so they can kick it and move it around and it's acceptable to them because it's a God of their making and not a God of the Bible. And I don't see any difference between what I just said and the idols that were worshipped in the time before the children of Israel were carried away into captivity. Now God... God said, you're going to be carried away 70 years by the prophet Jeremiah's mouth, 70 years. And God fulfilled that. God also fulfilled the bringing back of his people by the decree of Cyrus to let the people come back. But right here, right nestled right here in this 52nd chapter of Isaiah, there is a word lifting off of where this sits for you and for me. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. I took the liberty to put uh, on my tablet to put this out in the Hebrew. I just want to point out a few things that I think are very important. This word here, you don't need to know Hebrew or to read or understand, but the hithpael in the Hebrew is reflexive, so it is for yourself an imperative. So shake yourself off. I want you to write that somewhere in the margin of your Bible because these people were low and at a low point, but I want you to personalize it for you because when you go back to this chapter one day when you're really low and you say, I need something to lift me up, I want you to remember from God's book, from God's own prophet, said exactly as if he was speaking to, to you today and he speaks to us through his word, just like this. This is a reflexive command. Shake yourself off. Well, I've tried already, but I just can't seem to do it. Let me ask you a question. If you really believe that God was talking to you through his word and telling you to get up, well, maybe you would give him an excuse. I know if I'm reading this, I think these are God's words to me. I take them and I personalize them. And if God says, shake the dust off and get up, uh, it's not even how fast. It's, it's movement while it's coming out of the mouth of God. And that's how I take these words. 
in the reflexive, which means only you can do that. Now, I don't preach works. I don't preach that somehow you can save yourself. But I'm lifting this off the pages, and I want you to see the beauty of what's being said here. So you, you shake yourselves. I'll put it in plural, but it should be singular. You shake yourself from the dust. Now, you know, just the very fact that Isaiah is telling these people to shake themselves off from the dust means that they had hit a low point, wouldn't you say? <laughs> if you're in the dust, it means you pretty can't get any lower than that. So I like the fact that this is the starting point for anybody who has hit bottom. We sing a song, Get Up, Get Up in Jesus' Name. Well, this is, this pretty much fits the category, but you're going to see some other beautiful commands nestled right in here. Your King James does right and says, Arise. Here's another simple imperative. Shake yourself off. Get up. Get up. And this has been an interesting translation for me, but your King James doesn't even put this word in here. But dwellers of Jerusalem, Yeshuvi, Yerushalem, dwellers of Jerusalem, inhabitants, abiders of Jerusalem. And then here's another one of these reflexive, you can see, Hithpael imperatives. This one says, loose, loose or loosen. Your King James says, the bands of thy neck. Loose. Now, be careful here. When it says you loose yourself, you can't loose yourself from anything. But the ending of this helps me that the one doing the loosening for himself is not you. Someone is going to loose you. I love the fact that Scripture, all you need to do is, is read and it will confirm itself. What was Jesus reading when he went into the temple and he opened the Isaiah scroll that we read of in Luke 4:18, where he says he came to preach deliverance to the captives. Same words are being used here to show this is why I started with the resurrection. The gospel will set you free. It doesn't mean that you're guaranteed to float every single day of your life, but here's a good starting point, a reflexive command imperatively, and then I like the fact that it's something around your neck. Now, I had to make a few notes here on why I thought this was so relevant. A lot of times, and I'm only speaking to those people within the body of Christ, I can't help somebody out there who's not interested or hasn't been opened up in heart and mind to understand a thing about what God desires for you truly not what people profess God desires for. But I, I like the fact that right here in this one passage, I have, it's called a spiritual boot from God. You know the type every once in a while while you're busy feeling sorry for yourself? Listen, no one can speak on this subject without experience. Let that settle in for a little while. You know, somebody said to me, what do you know about being down. First and second and third book of Scott. <laughs> now, listen. I took all this and I thought, you know, we don't know the root cause. We know the root cause for these people being in the dust, but we don't know the root cause. This isn't a one-size-fits-all, and we say, oh, people, God's people get depressed. God's people are down. But I can tell you, and as I said, there are some people who have chemical imbalances and they have psychological issues. Trust me, I go work in the psychiatric ward of a lot of these institutions, and I know some of these people, um, don't try and tell them they don't have a problem. I'm not even going to try and tell you that, because they do. You don't need to go into a, a psychiatric ward to know that people in the ward actually have a problem. They're there for a purpose. 
And by the way, as long as Uncle Sam can keep everybody medicated to the max, we don't ever have to deal with it. Just telling you what I really think. The reality is I believe there are some people who have spiritual warfare going on. We can't walk around and say, well, that person's demon-possessed and that person's not. Only God knows what's going on inside the vessel of a person. But all I can tell you is it is common. You remember the scripture, there is no temptation such as common to man. There is nothing that will fall on the saint of God that God has not provided some doorway for you to walk through to escape the temptation. And I'm replacing temptation with trouble. I'm replacing temptation with uh, being downcast, with being sad. Now listen, for the real believers, there's always a time of sadness. We are a walking contradiction, overfilled with joy that we understand and we've come to the knowledge of Christ, and yet sorrowful inside. I can speak for myself. The contradiction is fully forgiven, and yet the complexity of sinning daily. Fully forgiven and the grace and the wonder of that forgiveness and the grief that comes with being a sinner, not because we've gone and committed a certain act, but because we're sinners. We sin. Now, all of this becomes an effort in futility if the whole sum total of what I'm saying isn't connected. We can, for some, we can try and trace back the root, you know. Oh, here it comes. Christian counseling, which is a very big uh, industry. Where people go and they seek counsel. And the only thing I'll say is a lot of times what happens in these sessions is we have people that will sit down and they want to, they want to pry into your life. Let's peel back the onion enough here. We'll get to the root of the problem and then we'll deal with it. But let me ask you a question. So I started with the resurrection. If we're really looking at ourselves and we see ourselves as a bunch of onions on the shelf, then each onion has its own pungent odor, its layers, and a core. All onions, well, they may have a different variety. I'm sorry, I went from people to onions. But you understand the concept of what I'm saying. We get into this mode where it becomes more of a perversion on the part of the person counseling the people to get into their lives rather than to say, you come to a fuller understanding about who Jesus Christ is. That doesn't mean that all your problems are going to go away and come on, get happy. In fact, you'll probably end up finding the valleys more easily than you did before. But the good side is you'll know where to look up to, and it won't be to a human being. It won't be to someone who takes, I believe many of these people are good-hearted people, but. They just want to take up the time to get inside the onion. Listen, leave the onion alone. <laughs> but rather, you bring yourself to the point of saying, only God can help me. You'll be like the psalmist in Psalm 69. I'm going to read it to you. You'll be like the psalmist saying, Save me, O God, for the waters are coming to my soul. I'm sinking. I'm tired of crying. My eyes are failing me. I'm waiting for you, God. You'll be like that. In a day where everything has become disposable. This is, I said, this is a hodgepodge, but it'll all come together when I'm done. In a day where everything is disposable, marriages are disposable, you don't like what you got. I mean, you know, it used to be in the day you, you bought it, you own it, it's yours. <laughs> right. I don't like it so much anymore. I'm, I don't want to deal with it. Next, in a day of disposability, from razors to marriage, even kids now, if you can believe that. I read that case about the kid who wants to have different parents and they're trying to get separation from the parents so they can have different parents. <laughs> this is the age we live in, not just the fast food society, and please don't talk to me about how ADD, Attention Deficit Disorder, has manifested itself so rampantly in our communities and in our lives. We're just less dedicated 
to being committed to something and standing up for what we want to be committed to. Unless, of course, you're in politics, and that's a different story. <laughs> but let me go back to this. In many diverse cases, what I find is that after a time when reality has hit me, I am more like the prodigal son, and you are more like the prodigal son who, in spirit or in mind, wanders away from the father's house, even for a brief hour in spirit, thinking, there's just got to be something better out there. And when you come to your senses, when you come back to your sanity, you realize the bread that's enough to spare in the Father's house is ample and enough to keep you not only sas satisfied, but to keep you happy. What did Jesus Christ tell his disciples? When we're speaking about our state of mind, he tells them, he has to go away, and they become very sorrowful until the day that they fully understood what his departure meant. And then the most important thing, that they might have peace, that his peace might be with them. And I think, where is that message in the church? Where is that message in our souls? Where is that message where, when everything is becoming the pressure, and I don't care if you, your pressure is real and bearing and waiting down on you, like Job in the sixth chapter, if you read that chapter in your own time, he says, the weight is crushing me. How many of you have been there? The weight is crushing me. Can't take the pressure anymore. But you made it through the pressure, whatever it was. You, somehow you survived the weight that you, th you thought you were carrying the world on your back, Right? Turns out that it was just not as big as you thought it was when it was all over. Now, I'm not making light of people's problems. I am telling you from this scripture something that became clear to me. There are a few things we can grab hold of when we're down in the dust. You know, there's only one way to go when you hit bottom. I have a few here in the church who have been kind of hanging on at bottom for a long time. Never reached for the handle to get back up because they're enjoying the self-centeredness of it all. It's, it's the reverse of good, uh, you know, good eyeballs and good attraction and good attention. It's that this is the way I will captivate you in my negativity. Now, for that one evangelist out there who likes to tell people to let it go, no, I'm telling you who can't seem to let it go, you better get a grip and start by what this scripture says right here. Shake thyself from the dust. Get up out of the dust. After a time, you begin to understand who God is. And I want you to see something very profound. For me, this is profound. Who God is through forgiveness and pardon of our temporary insanity. Do you remember the great story of Peter and how Peter was the one that made that bold declaration, Thou art the Christ, and Jesus says, Flesh and blood hath not revealed it to thee. Right? That's the greatest spiritual high to come to the awareness of who Christ is and yet to not be able at all to know him, which is why in, his, in Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17, he says that they may know thee, God, and his son Jesus, whom he has sent. Think about this in a profound way. After Peter denied Jesus, and it says he ran out and he wept bitterly. I want you to see in that moment, it doesn't really matter that the cause of his running out and weeping bitterly was that he fulfilled what Christ said he would do, but rather the state of mind he must have been in. There couldn't have been a lower moment in his life than the reality that he had been on such a great mountaintop. He was with the Lord. Thou art the Christ. Lord, let's build three tabernacles here on this mount. I'm part of the group. I was there to the deep valley he must have been in. And we read over that really quickly, but I was sitting and thinking, how deep he must have sunk in what he had done to betray Jesus in denying him. And then I read again John 21 afresh. 
And it reminded me that no matter how low we sink, no matter how low, the condescension of Christ in John 21 to come to Peter, by the way, to send a message specially to him, Go tell my disciples and Peter, the one who failed me the worst. That's why I'm telling you, those of you who find yourself in the state of being down and you can't seem to get out of it, I'm not telling you this is going to solve your problems. I'm telling you you are just like some of these in the Bible. That should give you the steps of encouragement to say, I'm going to grab hold of this verse 2 in Isaiah 52. I've been on the ground for too long. In fact, I've been laying in the dust for so long, I forgot what it's like to stand up anymore. And then remember the love that Christ showed to this one worst offender. And that's why I'm saying to you, at some point, don't think God is going to do all the steps for you and wind it up for you so all you have to do is, okay, now I'm ready to go back like a robot. But rather, you're human. And in your human condition, my human condition, falling down is going to be part of the trip. I hate to say that because there'll be people out there that say, well, the saint of God should never fall. Don't you know the psalm that says, my feet almost slipped? Yeah, but what about the time that they did? And instead of having someone come and remind you of your failures, which makes you sink even lower, I think our culture has become so self-absorbed that we're not happy anymore to just have a bed and have a roof over our head. We're not happy anymore to have the human touch of a hand beside us to just hold our hand or the companionship or the company and fellowship with the saints. We're not satisfied anymore. We've become greedy and arrogant. The things that we now desire create an even worse state for us to feel downcast. Not satisfied. It's what I was saying last week. Searching for something to satisfy, but you never find it. Why? Because the only thing that can fill that gap, that darkness, is the light. Now, I know that there are saints of God who fit the bill of Isaiah 50. They've been walking with God and periodically find themselves in the darkness. Saints of God, from Psalm 23, I just said, He leadeth me. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness. But here, the next verse over, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, how is this possible? But it is. And perfectly normal, too, lest anybody convince you otherwise. Now, I took all this... And I thought, I am at least going to make one point to all this, which is if you find yourself at the place where you are at rock bottom, shake the dust off of yourselves. Get up. I just said that song they sing, get up, get up in Jesus' name. And as you begin to take action to get up, the Lord will loosen the bands that you have so easily perhaps placed yourself in. You say, well, that's not fair. Well, it doesn't matter whether you did it, somebody else did it, Satan comes to sneak. It doesn't matter what it is that now has this feeling of oppression and depression on you. God is the breaker of chains. I've had more people in the last year come and tell me, I have a substance problem, and I'm ashamed to admit it, but I do, or I have an issue with these certain things. And believe me, there are, there are so many ways, so many diverse ways out there in the world to work out the problems that are never worked out, they're just camouflaged with something else, that rather than dealing with the problems spiritually, grabbing hold and saying, now wait a minute, first of all, I'm going to find a promise. After I've reached, grabbed hold, gotten up and shaken the dust off myself, I'm going to begin to look for the promise that will get me out of this pit. I may end up back here again, but right now I'm, I'm grabbing hold of the Word of God. Hebrews 12, 12 says, to strengthen the weak arms and feeble knees. And that is my job as, as a preacher to you, to strengthen you, to build up your spiritual endurance so that when the next test comes, when the, the next wave, like a 
And Psalm 69 does it real good. It's like a wave that takes over your whole soul and you find yourself not, you're not even able to breathe anymore. So frustrated with the oppression of life, discouraged with how your life you think is turning out, but rather maybe your life is like this because God is letting you walk in the path. That is the path for you, the righteous path for you as he chastens you, as you go through these things in darkness saying, God... Maybe that's the, the idea of God letting you be in darkness for a time. These chastening events sometimes are only the emotional side of the equation. It's not always that we're always in the valley, in a physical valley. It can be a mental valley. The pressure of that mental valley may be actually worse than being in the physical one. We are our worst enemies when it comes to imprisoning ourselves. You know, one of the eight largest causes, according to the clinicians, of depression in those natural, biological, but there are some that are learned traits from our culture. They're learned. And my guarantee to you is, I'm not saying that it's not a real sickness or real disease, by no means. But I am telling you, if you travel to the other side of the globe, in countries, third world countries, where people are more concerned about where they're going to get their food or where they're going to sleep that night, you have a completely different psychological aspect of understanding what type of mental pressure and cloud may come in a completely different realm. And that's why I said it's important for us to be thankful for the things we have, to be grateful, and not let sorrow, as Psalm 13 says, not let sorrow become our daily habit, that it consumes us. We have this idea somehow, if we'll just, you know, if we'll just let it, it, it'll take over. It's that one drop of ink that if you put it into clean water, it will contaminate the whole. A little leaven, leaven is the whole lump. I'm telling you right now as a congregation, if you're down in the bottom somewhere, not have you hit bottom or how hard it hurt when you got there. I'm talking about those ones who can't seem to get up off the ground. Shake yourself off, arise. The minute you begin that activity of faith, the Lord will begin to loosen the bands of your captivity. And I just quoted it, but I'm going to read it to you just a few verses down the road here. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, Isaiah 61, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Isn't that maybe one part of having a downcast spirit? And to proclaim liberty to the captives, the same word used in our psalm, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Now, I can't pray you out of it. I can't make you do it. But I can give you the instructions and I can tell you, unlike some of these syrup factories out there that are telling you, just let it go. No, this is, this is the real Christian pilgrimage. This is the real deal. When you know there are things God has in store for you and they're not all about what you have imagined they would be. The question that still always comes underneath everything is, will you trust him? Will you trust him enough that right at the moment that you think everything is falling apart? Now, I was about to quote Job, but a better quote from Job. In Job 19, he says, I know my Redeemer liveth. Well, I started telling you about the resurrection at the beginning because if you know your Redeemer lives, then the same power that he used to heal the sick and raise the dead is the same power that he will put into your heart and spirit to cleanse your mind. It says, by the word you are made clean. Now, I cannot make you, but you can look to him. The prison you might be in, I'm not speaking of the ones I visit. Those are the ones human hands made. I'm speaking of the ones that your mind makes. They're not made with hands. 
the battlefield of the soul most of the time is fought within those bars of the mind where daily people and good people around me, they can't even open the Bible. They don't want to pray. What's the point? God's not doing anything for me. My life is stagnant, whether it's your business or your personal life, whatever it is. You may think your mental prison just for you, created by you, designs by me. God says, I'll break those too. If you'll trust me, I'll break those bars that have kept your mind locked in prisoner and kept you in bondage. And unlike, forgive me, but unlike the children of Israel who when God delivered them out of Egypt's bondage, and I want you to see the parallel, when he delivered them out of Egypt's bondage, all they could do the whole trip was complain and complain and complain. Oh, it would be better we went back and had the food of Egypt. Oh, it would be better than to bring us out here to die of thirst or to be hungry. Never satisfied to simply trust in God and await his provision. If he's called you, and I don't say that as like, oh, check and see if you are. If he's called you, you're listening to me. If he's called you, he'll also make a way for you when you don't see how. And when you're at that rock bottom place, I remember the message Dr. Scott preached, underneath are the everlasting arms. And there was a time in my life where the free fall was so fast, there was no way that underneath bottomless of the bottomless, no, no, I'm telling you as a congregation, I hit hard. And when I hit, I wasn't expecting to hit because in the back of my mind, I thought, well, underneath bottomless. No, I, I, I hit. And it was, it, was, it was one of those shocks, like, oh, what was that? And it took me a little while to recognize that I, too, had to work to get up. This ministry, this is my life. I didn't choose this. Lord knows I didn't choose this. <laughs> but, but this is my life. This church is just a building, but it's the people inside the church. And I think to myself, this is my worry. This is my concern. This is my care. And these are the days when I bring a message like this that I think there may be one person here who has had the very same experience of hitting the bottom and for a time you just have to lay there in the dust and you can't figure how you're going to get up again because it just does not seem humane that you would fall so many times and that you'd be hurt so many times and that life would be dealing these absolute pitfalls for you. And then when you start to really come back to your senses, you start to grab hold of something, God's word, shake yourself off, arise, and as you begin to do that, God will begin to act in your life. And it's not going to be, by the way, a one-time cure and oh, I never have to deal with that again. If that were the case, there wouldn't be so many pastors and teachers that over the years have quit the ministry because the pressure, the idea that a man or woman of God might actually fail, that's too horrific. No, I really, I understand that. From my vantage point, I, I have to be willing to fail to know what God will do. If I'm not willing to do that, I shouldn't be here. Well, I, I think I, I fell a couple of times right in your face. They were hard falls. And somehow, along the way, one of the greatest miracles is I, I realized this is how God does it. Psst, he's not going to give you another method. This is the way he's going to do it for you. Don't go looking for the mountaintops, perpetually seeking them out. But neither should you be looking for the valleys and saying, well, I've got to find a dark place now. Can't live without a dark place. <laughs> got to have a dark place. Give me a dark place. But rather learn to enjoy and be thankful when those high points come and when the low points come, and they will. Instead of fleeing like Jonah and running away, press close to God. 
begin to understand your rock bottom experience, your, you can say, well, that's a lot of psychological gobbledygook. I'm not ready to grab hold of that because I've been to clinicians and I've been to psychologists and psychiatrists and I've been to people who have told me, this is what I got to do. Well, let me ask you a question. Before there were prescription drugs that are being widely prescribed and thrown around, before all of this uh, epidemic of uh, writing, of the doctors writing prescriptions, what did they do in Jesus' day? Tell me, has anybody ever stopped to ask that question? I'm not saying I'm against it, I'm just asking you, what did they do in Jesus' day? The guy, the man that was born blind, all he could say is, listen, I don't know about who this guy is. All I know is that I was blind, and now I see. The woman, when he spoke to her and he said, thou art loosed, she spent all of her money on doctors and nothing would cure her like the words spoken by Jesus Christ himself. I'm saying to you today, trust in God, keep your powder dry, and if you're on the bottom side of the equation right now, shake yourself off. Shake the dust off of you. Arise and begin to see God loosen the things that have kept you bound. And his gospel, not mine or some other human beings, his gospel of a resurrected life empower you that the same power that raised him up may dwell in you. That power is light. That power is able to quench every dark thought, every stronghold. In Jesus' name, that's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.